All right, I guess we should start. Um, so it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Alex Aiken, who's coming all the way from far away Stanford. And, um, you know, it's a great pleasure, particularly because I've known Alex for a very long time. And we've had the opportunity to work on some great things together. And he's done a lot better things after that. <laughs> So, um, he's, of course, you know, his expertise in the area of compilers, parallel processing, um, type uh, theory, you name it. Anything having to do with programming languages and compilers, he knows. And he's an expert on it. And he's greatly contributed to it. So, he's an um, endowed chair at Stanford. He's now doubly endowed, I guess, because That's he's correct. chair of the department. So <laughs> Um, he's an ACM fellow, and he's a very nice guy. So, <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, thanks, Alex, very much for the for the uh, kind of introduction, and it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, today, I thought I'd tell you about a, a project uh, that I've been working on for a few years with my students and and a collaborator at Google uh, that started out really as a complete Skunk Works project. Um, and has, has grown into something uh, a little bit more, and is now kind of at the point where I'm not embarrassed to talk about it in public. So here's uh, the Montgomery Multiply routine from SSH. Uh, so SSH is, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, it's a, you know, a core um, piece of software that we all use uh, to securely log in uh, to remote machines, and, and this is the core of the core, okay? So this is the routine that does uh, uh, the inner loop of the encryption and is performance critical. And on the left, you have the code that's produced by GCC minus 03. So this is with uh, this is GCC with all of its optimizations enabled. And on the right is the code that's produced by our compiler. Okay. And it's about 60% uh, faster uh, than the GCC code. So what I'm going to tell you about today is uh, you know how a team of uh, two or three graduate students. Um, could you know build a optimizing compiler that outperforms GCC and is maybe five percent of the size of uh, GCC. So, uh, so, so this is an idea that actually began uh, that I began thinking about when I was a graduate student. So actually, when I was when I was working with Alex, and uh, and. The odd thing about compilers, if you, if you hang around in the field for long enough and you think about compiler optimization, is that compilers really solve a search problem. Okay, so you, you begin with a program, and you want to find another program that's better. So you're wandering around, you're, you're starting from some program, and you're trying to explore a space of programs, and find a particular program that is you know, better than the one that you started with, where better usually means you know, it does the same thing functionally, but is faster or uses less memory or consumes some other resource. But usually the one we care about is time, so we want it to be, to be faster. So, so it really is, at, at, at heart, a search problem that compilers are doing. But the way they're implemented, they don't do any search at all. Okay? They typically are just a series of greedy steps through the space. So compilers have a bunch of tricks that they know, and they apply those tricks in some order. And, and, they, and they actually do you know, often, uh, or almost always, the, the big optimizing compilers produce many intermediate programs as they walk a path through the program space. But there's rarely, if ever, any consideration of alternatives or backtracking or anything like that. So, they, so it's, it's, it's strictly a, a greedy walk, um, downhill usually, trying to find uh, improvements, local improvements, until you get to a local minimum and then you stop. Okay. And you know, there's very good reasons um, <coughs> uh, for doing it this way, uh, but those were really good reasons in 1972, when when people were really, or in 1954, even going back further, when people first designed compiler architectures, and the way people thought about doing optimization when machines were extremely slow and memory constrained, you know, the world has really changed. And if we look at how search problems are solved in AI today, for example, they don't look anything like the way we solve this problem over programs in compilers. So uh, we, you know, I started thinking about what, what if we were going to start over? You know, what would an optimizing compiler look like? So if you're just going to wipe the slate clean and you were going to design a compiler without thinking about how people have done it for 40 years, what would you do? Okay. 
All right, so um, what would it look like to do search-based? All right, well, so what are some of the characteristics of the problem? So it's a very irregular high-dimensional search space. It's a nasty problem. There's you know, lots of complicated interactions between uh, all the different pieces, the different instructions, the bits of machine, you know, the machine resources, and the bits of state that you need to deal with. And uh, it's messy, okay? And that is one of the reasons that people have built compilers the way they have, which they've taken little bits of the problem and break <coughs> off and make it to nice problems and solve those independently and then have, you know, somehow compose all those pieces together in a, in a, in a bag of tricks architecture where you can try you know, each of those little ideas like register allocation, dead code elimination, whatever it is, uh, just you know, pull a trick out of the bag, see if it does anything good, and then try the next one. All right? Okay, so the other problem is that the search space is huge. All right, so I put up that little 20 line uh, x86 program. There are as many 20 line x86 programs as there are atoms in the universe. All right? So it's a really, really big uh, search space. Okay. And it turns out, though, that the people, are, I mean, we're not the only ones to face this problem. Okay. There are uh, lots of other domains where people have very similar kinds of messy search <coughs> spaces with, uh, you know, that are really large. And there is a standard technique uh, for dealing with that, and that's to use some kind of uh, random walk, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. And you know, this is, it sounds, you know, very imposing, but it's actually a very simple technique. And it's one of the top ten algorithms of all time. There are many, many problems in physics, uh, in statistical mechanics, uh, and in other parts of computer science where this is exactly what people do, and they get reasonable results. So maybe, maybe this would work in programming languages as well. So what would this look like? Well, you start with some program, and then you repeat the following procedure millions of times. You make a random change to the program, and you evaluate the cost. Okay, so you have some cost function that tells you whether the program got better or worse as a result of your random change. And if the program got better, meaning the cost went down, then you always accept that change. Okay, you're always happy when things get better. And if the cost increases, then with some probability you accept the change anyway. Okay, probably you don't, but uh, if, the, if the cost increase wasn't too bad, then you, you accept it. All right, and this has some very nice theoretical properties, it turns out. Okay. So, you know, it's guaranteed, um, if you observe some conditions, which I haven't put up here, that if you set this up correctly, that you will always uh, take the most samples from the lowest cost points. Okay, so you can prove that, uh, that this will eventually converge, and eventually is the operative word here, it's only an asymptotic claim. <coughs> Uh, to the best, the lowest cost uh, solution. All right. <coughs> so what would random changes look like? Well, so here, let's say we have some a, a program, and I'm gonna work, we're going to work at the x86 level. I'm going to work at the, you know, down at the assembly level. Primarily so, to, so that all the, you know, everything is exposed. Okay, so we have access to all the machine resources, all the crazy instructions. We can really get at all the details of the machine. And so, what sorts of things would we do? Well, we could insert a random instruction. We could delete a random instruction. We could take an instruction and just change it. Change its opcode and change its operands. Right. Uh, we could uh, replace an opcode. Just take an opcode and change it to a different one that's consistent with the arguments. Symmetrically, we could just change an argument. Right. And then we could just swap two instructions. Just pick two random instructions and reverse them uh, in the program. So, sounds like a great idea, right? <laughs> How many people think this is going to work? <laughs> oh, come on, don't all, you know, we should be <laughs> shouting. Yeah, like, uh, where's the excitement? Well, this is like a great new way to develop software. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, give, I give a version of this talk to our um, beginning programmers in our, one of our entry level courses and I, and I make the joke that this is pretty much how they program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just keep trying random things until we pass the test case. So, so uh, well, what, are, what are some of the issues with this? Well, it doesn't seem very plausible that this is any of these changes is going to make the program better. Right. Uh, and yeah, yeah, mostly it's not. Mostly it's going to damage the program. 
Well, one of the interesting things here is we're not focusing on the program being correct. Okay, so we're kind of freeing ourselves from the constraint that we always have to have a correct program. And boy, as somebody who worked in software verification, this is like liberating, all right? I, mean, I don't have to worry about the program being correct all the time. I can do so many great things, you know, with the program. Um, but, uh, but let me just point out that if you're a compiler person and you study compiler optimization, you know, buried in here is basically what compilers do. I mean, what is dead code elimination? It is deleting a single instruction. You have to get the right one, okay? <laughs> but that's all it is. It just deletes an instruction. You know, what is constant propagation? It's changing the operand of an instruction. Okay, so all the kinds of operations you want to do are expressible with these transformations. There's just no intelligence behind it. Okay. The other thing that's uh, interesting about this collection of, of uh, operations is that they're not orthogonal. Okay, so they're actually, you know, this is not a minimal set. And that's by design. That's not a bug. That's actually a feature. Uh, the, the kind of part of the dark art of designing these uh, Monte Carlo methods is you want some moves that take big steps in the space, and you want some moves that take small steps in the space. And so that's uh, so that actually is intentional that that these aren't all independent. All right. So we use Stoke in two different ways. One is uh, to do synthesis. And for sy when, when when people talk about program synthesis, what they mean is you know f forming a program from some specification, from not starting with a program in mind. Okay. So typically, when we do program synthesis, we start from the program with a single no op or a single return instruction. And then we try to find an implementation of a program that's been specified for us. And I'll say what the specification is that we use in a minute. But basically, um, the idea here is that we'll start, say, at this point out here. And the blue regions here kind of indicate regions of correct programs. And this is meant to indicate that there are different islands of correct programs that look very different from each other. So they're, you know, they really have different implementations. And, and, uh, and you wouldn't easily connect them between the two, <coughs> all right? And so we'll start, say, with a program that just has a single return instruction, and we'll use our cost function to guide the search, and hopefully we'll get to some of these islands where we have some program <coughs> that is correct, okay? And then in a second phase, we'll do what we call optimization, where we have uh, our cost function has both an equality term to measure correctness and a performance term to measure how good that program is. And then we'll, we'll start multiple search threads, one on each island, and try to find the best program on that island, okay? So the idea is that we'll start here, and now we're, we're rewarding both equality and performance, so it'll tend to stay in the blue region because it doesn't like things that are, you know, it wants to maintain, wants to maintain correctness, but it'll also hunt around in the blue region for the best program that it can find. And then among all those different competing programs that we find, we'll take the best one and return that as the answer. Question? Yeah. Does your definition of correctness exclude side effects? No, it includes side effects. So the question was, does the definition of correctness ex exclude uh, side effects? And no, this is full correctness, you know, uh, everything that you might think of as correct. But it's functional correctness, though. Okay. And in particular, we're not going to deal with things like concurrency. We're just looking at sequential programs for the point, for the purposes of this talk. Um, and yeah, and my and I'm going to work my way up to full correctness. So I'm going to make everybody's going to feel really uncomfortable that these programs aren't really correct until I get pretty far into the talk. But it, we will get there all right, at some point. All right. So now let me show you uh, a movie. So I don't know if the movie's going to work. Uh, let's see. So what you're going to see in this movie, uh, it's a little hard to read maybe uh, from the back, the back of the audience. On the left uh, will be. Uh, the um, uh, the best program that we found so far and the cost at the top and on the right will be the current state of the search okay and and we just start with a single return instruction and if we play then you can see you know, it, it, it's on the left again is the best program found so far and on the right you know looks like the matrix mm -hmm. and it's you know looking 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 cost is hanging or down around 20 or so best one we found so far is around four and then all of a sudden it's going to get it right about now, I think. Maybe now. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay, and that's the program I showed you. I showed you previously. All right. Okay, and that was speed it up a little bit. <laughs> all right. But actually, the current implementation will do, will do that in about 30 seconds on a single core. 
All right. What, what, is, what exactly is cost? I haven't gotten to that yet. Okay. <laughs> it's a great question, though. <laughs> All right. Okay, so what is cost? Well, here's the first idea. Okay? Cost will be the number of incorrect bits that I'll put on a test suite. So just hamming distance to a test suite. So I take the program that I want to optimize, I run it on some test cases, I record the output vectors, and then when I run a putative optimized program, I measure correctness by just how many bits of the output did it get right across the whole test suite. Okay? Actually, what I'm counting is how many bits it got wrong, all right, because higher cost is worse, and I want to drive the cost to zero. Okay. Now, <coughs> there is uh, another idea that actually, doesn't, that actually is a little too stupid. Okay? <laughs> that doesn't actually work. And the slight improvement is to reward getting the right answer uh, in the wrong place. So if I happen to produce the right answer at register 5, and I actually just wanted to see that in register 1, well, I ought to give you, most, I ought to give you almost full credit for that, because you're just one move instruction away from having the right answer. And this has a, gives you a vast improvement, because if you think about it, every time you make a change to the program, if you have, a, let, let's, take, let's just consider a function that only produces one output, okay? And let's say you have 16 registers. Then every time you make a change in the program, you got 16 shots at getting the right answer. So there's a little bit of parallelism there. You, know, you have some graph of operations and you're just making random changes to it and you're looking at all 16 outputs. And if you ever happen to find, you know, tweak some subgraph so it produces the right output in the, in the wrong place, you know, you're, you're almost there, okay? So that gives you basically an order of magnitude improvement to, to do that. All right. Okay, so now let me walk you through an example to explain to you, just with that cost function, why this isn't totally crazy and why this, you know, will give you some intuition for why this might actually work on some programs. And so what we're going to have here is a little program. We're going to synthesize. We're going to start from nothing. And we're going to try to synthesize a program to increment every element of a vector of integers. And we've got two uh, input registers. One holds the base address of the vector, and the other holds the number of elements of the vector. Okay, and here is a cost function timeline uh, for one run of search on a single core. And at the bottom is the number of iterations. Notice that's in millions, so it takes about six and a half million uh, iterations before the program passes the test suite. Okay, and again, we're working just here, just on a test suite. All right, but we have a bunch of example input-output vectors for incrementing every element. And, and sorry, input-output examples for incrementing every element of a vector. All right, and the other thing I'll point out, and just very quickly, is that you see these plateaus, these kind of this kind of stair-step behavior, where it you know coasts along, not not making any apparent progress for a long time, and then suddenly something happens, and then it coasts along at a lower level, and that pattern repeats at different scales. That is completely typical. Okay? That is actually the way this thing learns, and I'll explain how that, why it's that way in a minute. Yeah. So what do you do about badly behaved generated programs, things that make random operating system calls, stuff yeah, like that? Yeah, well, so, so the question was, what do you do about you know, programs that might crash Stoke itself? Yeah. I mean, you, would, you, would, you might imagine that in you know, millions of programs like this, we probably have more than a few that would crash the whole machine. Right, so in fact, we have to sandbox uh, all the operations, right? and that actually has an interesting ramifications, you know, both because that's that's in the inner loop, and so how we make it fast so we can actually so we, we do a hundred thousand to a million programs per second, okay, on a single core, and getting you know all the sandboxing and all that stuff to work fast is you know part of the clever engineering. And I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Sorry, another question. Yeah. How, how do you uh, reach the termination condition here? What, what, when does it stop? Oh, when the cost goes to zero. And if it doesn't? It keeps going. <laughs> okay. It's not guaranteed to terminate, right? There's no, there's no guarantee these searches will succeed. Right. Okay. <coughs> All right, so we start off now. We don't quite start from just a single return instruction here because we have a loop. All right? And so. We're going to give it a little template. We're going to tell it that it needs to come up with a loop. All right, so basically, there's a, there's a loop here with a bunch of no ops in it. Uh, the loop is carefully chosen so that it actually terminates initially. All right, so it doesn't you know, immediately go into an infinite loop. But the loop body and the preamble and the postamble are empty, and that's basically what it needs to fill in. But Stoke isn't allowed to fill with the jump and the label. It can only touch other pieces. 
So that's the, that's the only structure we give it. And now let's just see what happens as it runs. So you know, after a few hundred thousand iterations, this is the program that we have. Okay? And I've looked at this program and I can tell you it's completely confused. All right? There is no redeeming feature of this particular program. It's just, it's literally, it's proposing random instructions. Sometimes it gets a few random bits right. It's, you know, it's, it's the programmer who doesn't know what they're doing, who's just hacking, trying to get something to work. Okay, so that's what it looks like across that whole top plateau. But then all of a sudden here, it has a brilliant insight. Okay, all of a sudden it realizes that if it increments through that pointer to the first element of the vector, it gets one part of the answer right. Okay, <laughs> so it is now proposed take that pointer to the answer, take that pointer to the vector, and increment through it, you know, do an indirect reference and increment the you know, thing it points to, and lo and behold, it starts getting some bits right in the output and the cost drops. Now, it hasn't quite gotten it right. This is the increment byte instruction. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's thinking, treating it as a single byte integer, so it doesn't even do the carry out of the first byte. So it's not getting all the test cases right, presumably, even for the first element of the vector. But you know, it's getting some bits. And now what's going to happen is because the cost went down when it did that, it's going to want to hold on to that piece. It has discovered something that improves the output, and it's going to tend to conserve this. Because whenever it tries to change that instruction, the cost is going to go back up, and that's going to probably get rejected. <coughs> so it's going to tend to conserve this piece and you know, mess around with the rest of it. Right? And that's how it learns. It learns if your program is one that can be learned in chunks of code, such that each chunk improves the average um, uh, value of the cost function. If there is some path to do that, then this can very reliably learn functions like that. All right, let's see how it does it for the rest. Okay, so now, now it goes for a long time. This is the longest plateau of all. And what is going on? Well, you know, it's doing all kinds of crazy things. But then it has another remarkable insight. It discovers if it moves the increment instruction inside the loop, it gets more <laughs> of the answers right, okay? But why did it take so long to fi figure that out? Well, because another change was needed simultaneously. It also needed to be incrementing, uh, it needed to be incrementing the pointer, all right? If it was only if it just kept, if it moved that increment instruction inside the loop and it never incremented the pointer, then it would just keep incrementing the same element of the vector and it wouldn't get any points. So first it had to propose, oh, increment the pointer inside the loop. Then it could move the increment instruction inside. And then the cost would drop. All right? And this is also typical. When a couple of coordinated changes are needed, it takes lo much longer to discover that. So if the probability is P of proposing a change, then if you need two changes, you know, the probability will be P squared. <coughs> and generally speaking, Stoke can find uh, coordinated, can find, you know, productive, if, if there are, if there's a sequence of, if there's a combination of one, two, or three instructions that all need to be done together, Stoke can find that in a reasonable amount of time. You start getting to four coordinated changes, it can't do it. Are you going to talk about, uh, so I'm familiar with similar annealing, uh, which has a temperature schedule. Are you going to talk something about, about the probability schedule in the talk? Um, I wasn't planning to. Okay. I wasn't planning to, but it is similar. But this is very similar to simulated annealing. Okay, okay and we do, use a, we do use a temperature parameter, which mm -hmm. we, we, but, you know, it doesn't seem to make much difference for us. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't fiddle with it very much. Yeah. I'm a bit confused. So you're assuming that the real program is sort of known to you, or that the well, there's, there's a program you want to optimize. So you gave us a program oh, that see. you so wanted to improve. Point the <coughs> right now, but Stoke doesn't see that program. It just sees the input output pairs. So Stoke isn't looking at that program. It's just, you know, you're, we're just using that program as a, at least right now, as a as a test case. So it's generator. not that you're, well, you're synthesizing it, but the perspective of optimizing a given program. Yes. So why don't you start from the given program if you had that already? Like, is there any? Well, is because the way, the way a compiler generally works is that it will produce naive code, and then it will then it will go through a lengthy process of improving it. So I'm talking about a replacement for that process of improving it. So you gave me some program, maybe it's terribly slow, and you would like a better version. All 
right? And so this is a, so we're starting but from. But it's starting from zero, but essentially more or less from uh, no instructions whatsoever, right? That's so right. give you a running program. Right, but, you say, but that program is bad, that. right? I mean, there's no reason to believe that that program is a good starting but it's point. Quite, but it's EQ, or that thing is, uh, but the part of it, the, the correctness is there, right? So it has the correctness. It may be bad in performance, but uh, presumably yeah. it's doing the correct behavior. Yeah, that, well, yeah, we're, we're relying on it doing the correct behavior. But there's no reason to believe that the program you started with is a, is a, is a good starting point, uh, that, that if you started from that, that you would be able to find the fastest implementation. I see. Okay. It's so like the Montgomery multiply implementation I showed you. The reason it's so much shorter is because it really uses a different algorithm than the GCC code. Okay. I mean, it uses some of the bizarre instructions that the Intel architecture has that the GCC doesn't know about to do it in a different way. Right. And you wouldn't find that by starting from that code. For technical reasons as well, that if we, if we started the search from that code, you wouldn't find the better one because that, that correct solution is so attractive to the cost function it will be very hard for it to leave that local minimum. And you're much better off just kind of throwing it out in the ocean and making it swim, you know, to something. You might be able to find different solutions. I suppose another possible answer is that you want a shorter program in the end anyway, so why not start with zero rather than something Yeah, like you can look at it that way. I mean, I think, I think the question is well taken, though, because, you know, you, you're basically ignoring a bunch of information that you're given. There's a lot of information in that <coughs> initial program about, you know, how to, how to do the computation. And you know, we're, we're taking the point of the extreme point of view that we're only going to use a few input output examples. You know, that's, that's all the information we're going to call from that. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. so maybe I'm confused, but your notion of cost is really correctness. At this point, it is only correctness. So it's not and, performance. And, it, and it's only, uh, no, we're not using performance yet. So we're doing synthesis part. So the first step is just find a program that works. And then the second step is change the cost function to include a performance term. <coughs> And then you know use that to find a, a, a better program, you know from that point. And we do find that separating the two helps. Okay, that, that basically doing it in these two steps um, works better than trying to just start from nothing and have both cost and performance from the beginning. And this assumes that outputs are deterministic. This is all uh, sequential deterministic programming. Um, you know the cost function though can be anything you want. And we have looked at non-deterministic kinds of things. We've looked at cost functions that are much more forgiving. Like, you know, like for floating point, you, know, you may want to have a cost function that says, I don't really care about having bit accurate results. I only care about you know, relative error within a you know, half a percent. And, and that's a perfectly good cost function. You know, it'll find programs that give up a certain amount of precision and are much faster. And actually, that's a place where this really starts to pay off. Because if you can relax the notion of correctness a little bit, it could do things that no compiler could ever do. Yeah. If you looked at combining the random search with essentially inductive rules, maybe finding instructions that are completely isolated, taking no useful input, no useful output, and just yanking them? Uh, you know, we've fiddled with, we've started fiddling with that kind of stuff, you know, trying to make the search better. We haven't found anything yet that, we're, that, that is a dramatic improvement over what I've told you so far. All right, okay, one more, and then I'm going to move on. Yeah. Um, uh, your underlying assumption for correctness is that your test suite is capturing all aspects of the code. Right. Uh, but that's not necessarily... That's correct, yeah. So, uh, so the question here is, you know, the, the, the test suite, you know, may not um, actually cover all the corner cases, and you may get a program that's overfitted to the tests. Yes. We'll, that's a great point. We'll come back to that. <coughs> yeah. Okay. All right, so once it gets this far, then it makes very rapid progress. Because basically, at this point, it's all about fiddling with the loop bounds. And I've looked at many examples of this, and sometimes it's like incrementing every other element. Sometimes it's incrementing like you know the second, fourth, eighth, sixteenth elements. And sometimes it goes halfway through the array and quits. Sometimes it only does the back half of the array. I mean, basically, it fiddles around trying to figure out how much, how can I get the most credit? And it finally figures out that the way to get the most credit is to increment every element of the array. Okay. But you can see here, actually, there's quite a bit of flexibility in here. I mean, where it can, there's a lot of things it can do uh, with the bounds. And it does a lot of experimentation. But then all of a sudden, it comes up with this program. And now, so this program actually looks pretty good. Um, but to your point, uh, it's not optimized. There's still a couple of redundant moves and things and copies in this. And if we ran it, if we, you know, we started from this program and rewarded it for programs that were faster, it would squeeze all that out to give you the program you expect. Okay. All right, now, just to emphasize, this is stochastic. I mean, this is just one run. And if you run this again, you get some completely different behavior. 
right? Well, I shouldn't say completely, but you'll get different behavior. So here's uh, 30 runs. I thought one in blue is the one I, I, I showed you. But you can see that there are some things that are, there is some structure here and some repeated patterns. So like this business of discovering that fingerprint's one element of the vector, now, like, that's the first thing it finds almost every time. I mean, this, this plateau is a very strong feature across multiple runs. Okay, so it very frequently begins by first finding that. And then you can see some other places where you know, it tends to, where the, the, these lines are grouped, uh, where it's kind of, kind of figuring things out in the same order. Um, but you know, sometimes, and, and to somebody else's point, you know, sometimes it doesn't succeed. Sometimes it just, you know, after 30 million iterations, it's wandered off into the weeds. You know, it's not going to find anything, and we just kill it. Yeah. Uh, how do you decide what the killing point is of the program? When we get bored. Okay. I mean, yeah. So basically, we give it some sort of a budget. I mean, doing this in parallel. I mean, one thing that's really good about Monte Carlo is it's a it's a very easily parallelized uh, program. I mean, a very, uh, sorry, a strategy, and so we'll typically, when we're doing serious runs, you know, we'll, we'll have 150 cores. We just start search threads on all of them. And it's very nice because you, the running time, in that case, is the running time of the fastest one. Okay, so the one that, you know, gets lucky and makes a few lucky initial guesses and finishes quickly, that determines the wall clock time for the whole thing. Okay. okay. All right, so now let me tell you about a little bit about implementing this. So, you know, there's some serious engineering constraints that I've glossed over. Um, so this cost function that we're, it needs to be really inexpensive because it's in the inner loop and we're going to do it uh, billions of times uh, in general. And so the cost function is going to get split into two parts. We're going to have a fast approximate version that we do in the inner loop of the search. And then we're going to have a slow exact test that we do very rarely. And every cost function we design has to be split in this way. Okay, so you need the cheap version. And then you need the real, you know, thing that gives you the truth. All right. um, and essentially, what you do is you you run the search until the cheap version of the cost function says, yeah, this thing is is as good as it can be, that, you know, as best good as we can tell it can be with that cost function. And then we kick that program out and do the slow thing. All right. But hopefully, that's only once in millions of iterations. So, uh, so for correctness, I already told you about the fast cost function. We use test cases. Right? We use Hamming distance on, on test cases. But then for a slow, we use the theorem prover. We actually take the two programs, take the original program and the one we found, and we compare them for actual equality. Okay? And that's an interesting program equivalence problem. I'll talk about that some more. And then for performance, which I haven't been emphasizing, we actually do something that's kind of counterintuitive. We actually, for our fast cost function, is to sum the latencies of the instructions. And this is really coarse. Okay, so that doesn't take into account most of the microarchitectural features, and we've looked at looking into whether we can improve that. But we just right now we just sum up the instruction latencies, and then the slow version <coughs> is to actually benchmark the code on the target processor. And why is this the slow one? Is to your point, we don't know that these programs, these random these programs with random changes in them aren't going to crash the machine. Okay, and so we have to sandbox everything, and so the actual <coughs> running time of the code we run on the bare metal is not actually the performance of the thing that you would, you know, the, of, the, of the program once you're confident it's not going to crash the machine. Once you take out all the sandboxing, you'll have very different performance. Right? And so in the inner loop, we're having to sandbox everything, and that's why we use this static estimate. And then to actually benchmark, some of these programs are quite small. You know, what you do is you, you first run it in the sandbox, make sure it doesn't crash on any of the test cases. Then you strip out all the sandboxing, and then you <coughs> run it a thousand times on the test cases, you know, so that you can get accurate performance measurements. All right. Okay. So now let me tell you about an application of this to program optimization, which is the one I've been, you know, talking about all along. And now let me tell you a little more detail about how that works. So we start with a program uh, that we want to optimize. So we're going and, and by program here, I should be very careful to say, you know, it, this is a program where you know for a program that's less than 20 lines of code. Okay, so we're, we're talking about inner loops, things like that. Okay, we're not talking about whole programs. <coughs> so you run, you run that program on some test cases and you save the results. And then you use Stoke to find another program that matches it on the tests uh, and is faster. Okay, and then you want to check, and actually we don't do it in this order, I should say, but then you want to check whether these two programs are equivalent. So let's say that I find a program that looks good. It matches on the test cases. I believe it's a faster program. 
So now I'm willing to spend the cost to check whether the two programs are equal. Okay, how do I do that? Well, there's a problem here, which is that we discovered this program by a random process. It wasn't derived from the original program. And if you look at how compiler correctness is generally done, you rely on the provenance, the sequence of transformations you did to get from the original program to the final program. That's how all the techniques in the literature work. All right. So here we're not even starting from the original program, and plus, you know, we went through huge numbers of detours <coughs> that are probably completely irrelevant anyway to the ultimate proof. So, so really, given that there's no sensible translation in general from the original to the final program, you know, you're really just starting with two arbitrary programs and asking if they're equal. Okay, and this is the most general form and the hardest form of program equivalent. So what can we do? So there's an easy case, uh, which is that if they're loop-free. So if these are actually have no loops in them, and no floating point operations, and a few other restrictions, um, then you can just literally encode them directly as SMT formula. Uh, so so you know, every program there corresponds to, I mean, programs, uh, machine instructions are just circuits. You just represent the instructions as circuits, compose them together, build big circuits for both programs, ask if the two circuits are equal. It's very straightforward. And the SMT solvers do a good job. And there's a bonus that we get. When we do this comparison, if they're not equal, then the SMT solvers can give us a counterexample. They can give us a test case that behaves differently on the two programs. And this is how we deal with your question. So if our program that we found was overfitted to the test cases, then when we, go to when we go to check equality, we will get another test case that distinguishes the two, and then we'll put that back into our bag of tests and just start the whole process over again. We'll just do start searches over again, and we may iterate a few times. We may go around this loop a few times until we have enough test cases that cover all the corner cases so that when you get to this stage, they actually are equal. Right? But that drives the program. You know, so you know, if Stokes says, oh, you know, here's a program that satisfies the tests, you say, no, this other program actually does something different. I forgot to tell you about this test case. You know, we'll just repeat that until, uh, until it converges. And that generally only takes one or two of these big iterations to do that. Okay? All right. Now, but the, but the interesting pro case is what if the two programs have loops like the example that I showed you? So, uh, and so we're going to follow what's a pretty standard uh, approach here, but we're going to need some novel um, technology in order to uh, carry it through. So the basic idea for handling loops is if you want to prove two loops are equivalent, you have to have some kind of inductive argument. And the typical kind of inductive argument would be they're equal after the first iteration, they're equal after the second iteration, they're equal after the third iteration, you know, blah, blah, blah. You prove they're equal after the, you know, the nth iteration, they terminate, they have similar termination conditions, you prove something about that, and therefore they, they're equal, right? So you break the proof for the loops into a, a bunch of subproofs where each subproof depends only on loop-free code. Okay, basically you're reasoning, only have to reason about the chunks, you know, before the loop, after the loop, and in the loop body, you know, some decomposition of the two programs into <coughs> loop-free pieces of code that you can line up and prove something and construct an inductive proof. All right. So we're going to need uh, we're going to break the loops up, and we're going to there's a concept called a cut point that comes from hardware reasoning. And a cut point it's actually kind of a lousy name because it's not one point; it's actually a pair of points. Okay, it's a point in each program that correspond. And then we're going to have invariance at the cut points, relationships between the two programs at the cut points. So here's a little program. Okay, um, <coughs> so this is just a uh, a program that does a uh, does a copy. All right. Oh, actually, no. I think I, oh, I don't remember what it does. It's not doing a copy. Um, I got it on the next slide. Yeah, it's just decrementing. A, it's just decrementing an integer to zero. Okay. And and in one version, uh, one version you know, does all the work in memory, and another version caches a value in a register. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to prove that these two are equal, and I'll show you the method that we use. So what are the cut points going to be? Well, one cut point that you always need is the beginnings of the two programs, right? So the entry point to the two programs, that's always a cut point, 
and your invariant there is going to be that the entry states are the same. Okay, that's an easy one. That's your precondition. All right. Okay, so now then these two programs execute <coughs> forward and we're thinking about lining them up, okay? And we have to have a cut point inside of every loop because we want all the uh, fragments of code that we're gonna be proving things about to be loop free. So we're gonna have to break every loop, uh, pair of loops with a cut point. So if we execute forward, then the cut point that we'll choose, and I didn't, I'm not gonna tell you right now how we do it, is uh, this one, okay? So right after the test in both, um, in both programs. And the invariant we're gonna need there is that in the, in the first program, this value on the stack is equal to this register, okay? And these are facts about that program. So eight, um, you know, the, the value at RSP plus eight is, uh, is equal to the value in RDI, and that's equal to the value in this program in register nine. So primed values refer to the uh, state on the right, and unprimed values refer to the state on the left. And then, what we're gonna prove, all right? I just forgot to say, let me back up, sorry. So the first thing we're gonna prove is that if we start the two programs in equal states, then when we get to this cut point in both programs, that this fact holds. Okay, that's the first proof. And you can see that that's loop free, so it's just a couple of SMT formulas, it's just a big SMT formula, you know, hand it to a solver and see what happens. Then the second fact we're gonna prove is that if we start at this cut point with the invariant holding, and that program on the left goes around the loop one more time, then the program on the right will also go around the loop one more time and reestablish that invariant at, the cut, at that same cut point. Okay, that's the second step of the proof. All right, and then the last uh, part of the proof is that if we're at this cut point and this program exits, goes to the return statement, then this program will also exit and we will be at this cut point here where the live outs are equal. So the results of the functions are equal. All right, and that's an, and if we can prove all three of those facts, there are, th there are three cut points, there are three separate proofs about transitions that the programs can make. If all those are true, then the programs are equal. All right, so this is a standard technique. Constructing these cut points, constructing these invariants, this is all stuff that, that people know. All right, okay. And it's called a simulation relation, right? It's, it's even so well known that there's a whole literature on it. It's called a simulation relation. And, it, and it's called that because R simulates T. All right, <coughs> now, so given a simulation relation, proofs for the loops reduce to subproofs for the loop-free fragments. And then you use SMT solvers for that, okay? And then the problem, the research problem that we were faced with is how to get the simulation relation because the, because this is something that's sort of assumed that you get it from the relationship between the two programs. So if you knew the sequence of transformations, you can just generate the simulation relation yourself. Here we have to infer it all from scratch. So we have to figure out what are the cut points, and we have to figure out what are these invariants, right? And I'll show you how we do that. Okay, and the way we're going to do it is to mine these relationships from data. We're going to be data driven and we're going to actually use program executions to form the hypothesis about what the cut points are and what the invariants are and then we'll use the SMP solver to verify that. So it's going to be a guess and check procedure. So how do we get the cut points from the data? This is very simple. We just count the number of times program points are executed and use that to rule out infeasible pairs of cut points. So for example, if I look at these two statements, well, that's a pretty lousy choice of a cut point because this one's executed one time and this one's executed every time around the loop. Okay, so that would probably not be a logical choice. There are some others that are more plausible but don't quite you know, work with the standard definition of a simulation relation. So for example, this that point on the left is executed n plus one times and this one down here is executed n times. So how do you exactly line those two up is not completely clear. Uh, but you know these two are executed n plus one time, so that's a potential uh, cut point, all right? And then these two are executed n times, that's another potential cut point, all right? And so what we do 
is we just find all the program points on a set of test cases in the two programs that execute the same number of times. Those are the potential set of cut points, and then we brute force over that. Okay, so we just we just guess a set of cut points, and then if that set of cut points turns out not to work, we'll come back and try a different set of cut points. <coughs> yeah. So you did mention that determination of the cut points and invariance is sort of data driven. Yeah. What amount of state do you maintain in the executions of the programs themselves to be able to determine those cut points and invariance for them? Right. So, so this is all outside of the inner search loop. So in the search loop, we're not doing any of this stuff. This is the slow procedure. This is the verification procedure that we do once in a great while. And so we can fully instrument these programs to keep track of whatever we want at this point. Right? So we can count the number of times every program point is executed, you know, do all that sort of stuff. So it's almost a separate run with all of the Yeah, yeah, this is a completely separate set of code, too. I mean, it's just you know, different code paths in the system. So how general, though? What do you do if the thing unrolled a loop and all of a sudden it's very hard to match up things? Right. So that's what we're working on now. Yeah, so the standard definition of simulation relation is, is too restrictive to, hand, to express things like loop unrolling. We need something more general, and that's doable. That's doable. We, had, I mean, we haven't done it yet, and this is what we've got. So if it fails, then you don't have a test case. That's correct. I mean, the verification may fail. Right. Yeah, it may, it may completely fail. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now the invariance, so we're going to restrict our invariance to equalities. Um, and we're going to infer the invariance from the observed values. So let's take a look here. So we can observe, for example, at this point in the program that you know, these two um, program quantities have these values over a set of test runs. Okay. So actually, if you just execute the loop once, Sorry, if you just execute this program on one test run and just record all the values, uh, these are the values you would have, some of the values you would observe at that program point. <coughs> and then we can do the same thing for the other program at the other you know, point that's part of the cut point and just record the value of R9 prime. You know, at every, on the same input and every time I reach that point. And I just form a matrix saying the first time I got to these points, these were the values. The second time I got to these points, these were the values. The third time I got to these points, these were the values. And it's not too hard to see what the hypothesis would be from this data, okay? But there's an easy way to mine all the equalities out of this matrix. You're just looking for the null space. It's just a little bit of linear algebra. So you're looking for a vector w that multiplied by the, on the right by that matrix makes the matrix zero, makes the answer zero, okay? And that w then captures all the equalities, <coughs> all the linear equalities in the matrix, all right? So. Uh, so for this particular example, this is exactly the invariant that we needed, okay, that we get from that matrix. I just, uh, you know, have here some other examples of much more complicated invariants that we get out of other, you know, examples that we've done. So things like strength reduction, you know, get captured by um, this data mining. You know, you're comparing one program where, you know, a, a bunch of, uh, uh, index calculations have been optimized with the original, that will show up as some complicated linear invariant between the two couplings. Okay. All right. So then, the, so once so that so we guess the cut points and we guess the we we hypothesize uh, the um, the variance uh, in the simulation relation and then we take that guess, build uh, the proof obligations. Um, can query the SMT salt, all right? And to the question that was asked, this is sound but not complete. So if it succeeds, then yeah, it's equivalent, but it can fail, we can fail to infer a correct simulation relation. And we can actually construct counterexamples here too, okay? Not always, but often we can construct counterexamples which we can, if, 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 the, if the proof fails, which we can feed back into our set of test cases. All right, let me show you some benchmarks. Um, so these are just some small kernels. Uh, the Montgomery multiplication kernel I showed you before. Then we've got you know, a, an awesome linked list traversal algorithm and uh, inner product. And so here, uh, uh, we're baking off against GCC and ICC with all optimizations enabled. And the red bars are Stoke. And then the, the, uh, the, line, the black line is normalized to GCC with no optimizations at all. Okay, and the, but the takeaway here is that basically Stoke does as well as the production optimizing compilers or better uh, in almost every case. There's some cases where it's a little worse, some cases where it's a little better, and then some cases where it's a lot better. Okay? And, and this, I should say, I should stress, this is, and, and in addition, 
this is fully proven correct with the original program. Okay, so this is actually, it's not what the compilers do, which is best effort correctness. This is actually fully verified. Yeah. So they, they were the first picture showed that they were islands, right? Yeah. So I'm assuming the GC code is one of those islands. Right. And the question, I guess, is how many times do you see this stored program go right. to another island? Right. These are the ones where it found a completely different implementation that was way better. Right. right. So basically, if, it's on, if it winds up doing this more or less the same thing, you know, that's pretty much where the bars are the same. And you know, where it actually starts to really outperform, that's where it found some trick and it got into a completely different part of the space. All right. So speed ups are up. You know, those the, the best examples there were seventy percent of production code. But you know, actually, this is still is an expert code, and experts can do much better. Contrary to the um, advertising here from compiler people, you know, actually people who sit down and write assembly code by hand can usually do way better than a compiler. And so why can't we get that code? All right, so we started looking at that. And the problem is that our verifier, turns out, rejects many good programs. The proof technology is actually not sufficient <coughs> to verify uh, a lot of the really clever optimizations that the, the system finds. And it's not because the, the verifier is too dumb. It's that the verifier doesn't know facts about the rest of the program, about the context in which this piece of code is executing. The humans who go and hand optimize this code know all kinds of facts about restrictions, basically, on the inputs, the possible inputs to the piece of program in the context of that program. And they're taking advantage of that. Whereas uh, you know, the verifier has to assume that any input is possible. So I'll give you an example. So here, just doing a, just just copying four words. If you were going to write that in C, you might write it like this, okay? But if you're an expert, you would write in assembly code this. You would use vector instructions uh, to do the move. All right. Now, the problem is that that won't work if A and B can overlap. If the two short vectors you're copying could actually overlap, that won't, that rewrite won't be correct. And actually, it'll also seg fault if they're not 16 by, by aligned because of the restrictions on the vector instructions. But you know, assuming those two things are true, this would be the right thing to do. Okay, but these are the kinds of facts that experts make use of when they know things and that the compilers generally don't know. So, so you can't use a, so, so some of the tricky rewrites that we find, we can't use in an arbitrary context. And it's kind of a shame to throw away those, those things. And so we started thinking about how to take advantage of that. And so, uh, so what we really need uh, to get the absolutely best performing code, the kind of thing an expert would write, is something we call conditional equivalence. We need to have a precondition that uh, we get from the code itself. Under what circumstances is this super fast piece of code going to be correct? Okay, so in addition to just giving you the fast code, we should also give you this precondition. So how, do we can, how can we do that? <coughs> well, coming back to our example, so this particular piece of code is conditionally correct, which means it's equivalent to that piece of code under the precondition that the two vectors don't alias and that they're both 16 byte aligned. Okay? And what we want to do is make these kinds of uh, preconditions explicit. So here's how we do it. So Stoke generates random programs. It goes into our equivalence checker. And now we feed in a condition C. OK, so we say we only really care about having correctness under some precondition. Okay. And then out comes a few programs that, are, uh, that go through performance tests, and we pick the fastest one. All right? OK, so that's the first architecture, which is actually not that great. Because figuring out what these conditions are this actually turns out to be really painful. All right, this actually is this actually isn't easy, both because it's not always easy to understand the context, but also because staring at the code and trying to figure out under what conditions it's correct is actually hard. So what do we do instead? <coughs> well, what we do instead is we actually feed back information into the equivalence checker and we infer the condition. So we both find the program and then we infer the condition under which it will be correct. Right, and we report that to you. And we say, here's a fast rewrite. This is equivalent if these facts hold, like you know, the two, ve two input vectors aren't aliased. Okay? 
And then it's up to you what to do with that. You can decide whether to use that condition or not in your code, but at least you don't have to go figuring it out. All right, so we give you more information. And now the programmer is happy. Well, he's happier. Okay, and how do we get that condition? Again, we're going to use data. We're going to mine it out of data. Uh, so, and, these, and this data mining piece is really simple. So you were just running on a bunch of test cases, remember? And if you <coughs> observe that the two inputs in the test cases are never aliased, well, then that, that's a logical conclusion that perhaps they never are aliased and we can rely on that. If, the, if, if all the input cases are 16 byte aligned, well, then, then probably you know, that's, that's a reasonable thing to assume. And similarly, we mine equalities, like I showed you before, from uh, the matrices of, uh, of the, all the observed values. And we, we do some floating point specific things, and we mine some inequalities too. And I'll just say that these, these test cases we're using here, I didn't explain this before, but we get these from the context of the program. You're trying to optimize some function in a bigger program. And what we do is we run that whole program on some inputs and then capture the actual inputs to that function. So we're getting the inputs in the context of the whole program, which will encode all the implicit restrictions on the possible inputs. Okay? So we're not just making up that they might not be alias, is that we ran the whole system on a bunch of inputs, and this function that was called a million times, we never observed any overlap you know, in the actual arguments that were passed to that function in that context. All right, so trying to wrap up quickly here. So we have our application. Inside that application is some function you want to optimize. And now I'm telling you about the ultimate thing. Okay? So this is like the best. You know, yeah, so everybody needs to wake up and pay attention to the results here at the end. Uh, this is, so we're trying to optimize this function t inside this application. Okay? We, inf um, what are the, and we, we, we go off and optimize t using the inputs we got in this context. We get out the condition and the rewrite. Everything has been checked for conditional correctness. So we know that the rewrite and the original function are equal if that condition holds. What do you do? Well, one thing you could do is you could do whole program analysis to verify that condition always holds. Okay, forget that. Okay, nobody knows how to do that. The second thing you could do is you could manually decide that, that you can manually check that condition yourself. All right? I think that's what a lot of programmers would do, but you can't publish that. All right? <laughs> and so the third thing you can do is you can put a runtime check in. All right? where you uh, say, well, if the condition holds, then go execute the fast path. Otherwise, just do the thing that you already knew was you had before. Okay? So just hoist this check out and stick it, as a, stick it on like that, and that's the code you generate, which is guaranteed to be correct. All right? And now you can run a bunch of experiments that you can publish. And what do those experiments look like? Okay? So here's conditional GCC. All right, so we took a bunch of test cases, which unfortunately are not the ones I showed you before. Uh, so you can't compare. Now the baseline here is GCC with all optimizations enabled. Okay, so this black line at one is GCC, the best code GCC can produce. These first blue bars are GCC with hand annotated annotations, I mean, hand added annotations. Like I've gone in and added restrict annotations to kind of tell you, tell GC as much as I can tell it about the context and see what it can do with context information. All right, so to the extent that GCC lets you express these conditions, these are the improvements you get for those programs. All right? <coughs> and then here's Stoke. Uh, and this is with uh, the conditions, this is the conditional, conditionally correct code put in without the runtime check. Okay, so this is like the best case if you just believe the check is always, if you just believe the condition is always true, these are the kind of performance you get. All right? <coughs> and if you put in the runtime check, this is the performance you get. You can actually see that, actually, in a lot of these cases, the check pay is still you still pay it. It still pays to put in the check, and you still get a lot of performance. All right, and there are some cases where the overhead of the check isn't worth it. All right, and so you would either need to verify it by hand or just not bother uh, with that. Okay. So, um, all right. So why does Stoke work? Well. There's a few reasons it works. First of all, it has a larger repertoire than GCC. So most compilers, because of their structure and the kind of regular, uh, they need to be regular in certain ways, they don't understand the whole instruction set. They understand a very small subset of the instruction set. Whereas Stoke knows about all 3,000 instructions in the, in the x86 uh, instruction set, and many of those are tricky, weird things that were put in there for performance for people like you know, games programmers and things like that. And Stoke doesn't care, it just uses them, and if it gets better, great. 
Okay, it doesn't have to understand what it is, but it has this it has this vast repertoire of stuff it can do. And then we do a lot more effort. We spend way more time compiling, you know, adding one to every element of a vector than GCC ever would. And finally, we have this ability to prove correctness. So you not only get faster code, you actually get code that's verified. To be correct. Um, so, and then, you know, optimization is a natural application, and we have this division into search and verification that I, that I told you about. Okay, so the engineering is designed to make this, you know, the search is very parallel and efficient uh, in terms of, you know, the time spent in the inner loop. And then we only do the really expensive things once in a, in a blue moon. All right, there's a bunch of related work. Thank you. So have you tried other stochastic search algorithms like Monte Carlo tree search that has been very popular in other AI areas? You know, what, what's happened is that over time we have, um, we, you know, we have, as we've hacked on the system and, and tried various improvements, you know, we, our, our search algorithm has changed a little bit, and we haven't found it makes a big difference. We haven't tried these other ones, but I don't notice a whole lot of sensitivity to the exact search strategy or even the weights on, you know, what instructions you try and things like that. <coughs> yeah, so it seems to be fairly robust in that way. Um, related to that point, uh, might this uh, search problem be better modeled as a learning problem instead? For example, if your model has already looked at incrementing by one, uh, incrementing by, uh, by two might be, uh, uh, might be optimized much quicker. Yeah, so the question is, you know, can, can, you, can you transform this into a learning problem? And I think there is something there. I mean, one of the things we would like to do, I mean, it's so expensive to find these things, uh, that once you found it, you'd like to remember that. And you're like I, like, I saw this piece of code before, and I already found something that's pretty good. You know, that, and it's very similar. And you can imagine using that as a starting point for the search. And we would like to do things like that. We haven't, we haven't had time to explore any of that. So you address overfitting the test cases in sense of correctness. Yeah. But is there also an issue of overfitting the test cases in sense of performance? There may well be. Um, the way we judge performance in the end is just actual you know, time on the bare metal. And the, and the way we try, try to avoid the overfitting is that we save the top end uh, solutions that we find. And then we, 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 we at the end, we, you know, we, after, we, after we're convinced they're all correct and won't crash the machine, then we bake them off against each other, actually. So we don't just keep one program. And this actually turned out to be really important, and I think it's exactly your point. I mean, what, what, what would tend to happen is that the very fastest program we found would tend to be overfitted to the test cases. Okay, and there might be other points along the way where we found things that passed all the test cases that weren't as fast, but actually weren't as overfitted. And so, you know, the, the correctness performance uh, combination was better. Uh, I mean, they were, more they, were, they were actually correct and still performed reasonably well. Other questions? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Would you approach concurrent programs in the same way, you know, starting out with this kind of randomized? I have approach? no idea. <laughs> I mean, I, mean I, haven't, I really, we haven't spent much time thinking about it, but, and that's partly because every time we start to think about it, it just makes your head hurt a little bit. So we don't, <laughs> we don't have a good idea. And, and, and part of the problem there is that you know, doing it at the assembly level is almost certainly the wrong thing to do, okay? Because you need, I mean, there's nothing explicit in the, in the assembly level code about where these other uh, threads might be mutating state, right? And so you probably need to do it at a, either, we need to do one of two things. You need to either do it at a higher level where there's, where the, the, the concurrency is explicit in the syntax, and so that's part of what you're mutating. And then you can sort of imagine how this would work. I mean, I could, I could move critical regions in and out and see if things, you know, pass test cases and stuff like that, and then try to prove them correct. I mean, a similar strategy might actually succeed. Um, or you can just say, okay, you know, for concurrent assembly code, I'm just not going to make, I'm not going to allow changes to the heap. I'm just not going to mess around. I mean, whatever the original program was doing with the heap, I'm going to, I'm going to keep that, and I'm going to only make random changes on the register context. I mean, the register move instructions and things like that. Did you have to build SMT translation for 3,000 instructions? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so we had to build SMT formulas for 3,000 instructions. And actually, that's a great question because I, I, I was going to mention, um, you gave me the opportunity to mention a paper we have coming up. Um, uh, in the end, we did about, we, we didn't do them all, okay? And what we've actually done is use Stoke to learn uh, the rest. So what we do is we say, there's some core set that we wrote the specifications for. And then if we want to learn the semantics of a new instruction, 
We say, okay, Stoke, here's a program, one instruction program. Give me another program written only in this core set that we don't know the semantics of that does the same thing. And we do that like 200 times, get 200 programs, compare them all to each other. If they're not equal, we get counterexamples. We put those back into the test cases. Eventually, it can't find a semantically different program. And then we take that one and learn and say, okay, that's the semantics. You know, the formula for that is the semantics of this instruction. And then we put that instruction back into our core set so we can learn more. And this kind of stratified synthesis where we gradually build up, you know, bigger and bigger vocabulary. Um, you know, so interesting, we learned things at Strata 16. So they had to learn, you know, depth. I mean, it had to learn a sequence of instructions 16 deep before it could learn the semantics of some complicated instruction. And, and when we compare this to handwritten formulas, uh, we found some, we found bugs in the handwritten formulas, but no bugs in the mechanically generated ones. So, yeah. So, um, you've done this on this uh, assembly instructions. Uh, yeah. Have you tried it on higher level languages, no. like Java bytecode, and you think it would be any more or less challenging than some? I, you know, I, I think, it, I, mean, I mean, Stoke doesn't care about the syntax. I mean, the, the cost function is the only intelligence. And it's just looking at, at an overall number. It has no idea what these building blocks do. I mean, the only part that knows about that is the verification piece. So the search piece is really completely agnostic to what these building blocks are. All right? And in that sense, it's very nice. You could play with any thing. I, I mean, I think the challenge for something like Java, I mean, I mean you could do it at a higher level language, no problem. I mean, that would absolutely work. Um, you probably don't have quite as much control over performance or, uh, or capturing performance variation. Okay, that's one thing. Uh, but again, the cost function doesn't even have to. I mean, it, it could be. A, I mean, you could run things multiple times and take averages. There are ways to deal with, uh, you know, some kind of non-determinism in the performance. Like you know, garbage collection happens sometimes and sometimes not in this piece of code. You just <laughs> run it a bunch of times and you know, take averages. That's the kind of thing you'd have to do with concurrency too. You're not going to be able to just have one test case. You're going to have to you know, run it a bunch of times to see you know, what the performance and correctness spread is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank I you. apologize for being your face.